Good afternoon. This video is about protein purification and characterization. Our learning objectives for this are to be able to develop a plan to purify a protein, tell why proteins are least soluble at their PI or isoelectric point, describe protein characterization methods, describe the theoretical basis of SDS PAGE, that's sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, Describe the theoretical base, basis of mass spectrometry for proteins. Describe the theoretical basis of X-ray crystallography. Protein purification and characterization. We focus primarily on soluble proteins because they can, we can purify those. Proteins such as collagen that's part of bone or elastin that's part of your lung or keratin's part of your fingernails are very difficult to purify because they're not soluble. Soluble proteins are therefore easier to study. Uh, pure proteins are easier to study. You can get a lot more uh, really good data from pure proteins. You can't do clean work with dirty proteins. So uh, it's good to have a pure protein to make sure you don't have any interfering activity or interfering protein. So when you measure a uh, function of an enzyme, for example, that protein is all that enzyme and not another one that might be contaminating it. Proteins are drug targets, so once you get a pure protein, you can test it, uh, test drugs against it to see if they inhibit it. Protein purification and characterization. The first thing you need to be able to do is detect and measure, have a detection or measurement method for your protein. Uh, if it's an enzyme, you can use an enzyme assay in which you measure substrate disappearance or product appearance. Or if it's a colored protein, you can measure how much of that color is there. Measure total protein. There are various methods for doing that. A real old one is called the Lowry method. Uh, the Bradford method uh, is based on Kumase Blue. There's also a BCA method that also has a different reagent in it. And then there's an A280 method. It's just absorbance based on tryptophan, tyrosine, and cysteine content. So you choose your methods. You can use solubility, ion exchange, affinity, etc. to possibly purify your protein. We'll talk about those as we go forward. And then finally, once you get it, you can characterize the purity by SDS page and mass spectrometer. You get, your, you get information on the size of the protein and its sequence. And then you can do amino acid sequence as well by Edmund degradation. That's an old method and mass spectrometry. Edmund degradation we'll talk about as well. Uh, determine 3D structure by X-ray crystallography. And now you've got a beautiful picture of your enzyme or protein. Now, proteins uh, fold uh, spontaneously, and that folding is driven by entropy. That entropy is the release of that water, these water molecules and allows them to more freely move about. And the hydrophobic residues in red tend to go to the inside of a protein, and the hydrophilic ones are on the outside. So the water, and over here you have an oil-water interface. That water is not free to move into this space where this hydrophobic residue is. Over here, that water is freed up to move, and that drives the process of uh, entropy to drive the folding reaction. Now, enzyme assays are quite often done in 96-well microtiter plates or even larger ones. And those are very useful because you can scan wells all at once. Uh, you can look at, you can do a rate reaction on this well over time and compare it to this well that have some standards. And then you can do test inhibitors and in various other wells. So it's a really unique, uh, easy way to do it. Uh, most labs have micro, micro uh, titer plate readers now. Uh, there are even some that can read A280 if you have a plate that has, that's UV visible. Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be quite it can be a certain plastics that are UV visible, and you can measure protein in these as well. Centrifugation, you can do uh, differential centrifugation. Uh, the, in various ways, you can isolate nuclear fractions, mitochondrial fractions, or microsomal fractions. You can isolate Golgi and various other things, and that could enrich your sample for the enzyme you wish to purify, and I'll show you an example of that later. Uh, you can also dialyze your protein. That is, when it has salt in it, you can put it into a buffer with no salt and or water, and eventually that uh, the, whatever the ions are that are small will come out. Your protein, which is larger, will be held in. These bags can be of various molecular uh, size exclusion. Usually it's about 12,000 uh, is standard dialysis tubing, but you can also have various units that meet, use semi-permeable membranes like this uh, under pre nitrogen pressure or pressure to concentrate and dialyze proteins. 
proteins are least soluble at their isoelectric point. Proteins uh, have uh, either a net positive charge or a net negative charge, depending on the pH. So at low pH, they'll have a net positive charge. At high pH, they can usually have a net negative charge. And uh, in between somewhere, there will be the isoelectric point, or PI, and that's the point at least charge. Solubility is lowest at this point because there's no repulsion. Over here, at positive charge, the, the molecules repel each other. At negative charge, they repel each other. But at the isoelectric point, there's no repul repulsion, and they tend to hydro they have hydrophobic residues. They'll stick together. So here's a, a protein with its hydrophobic interactions, um, and those can't occur because of the water molecules surrounding them. However, if we want to precipitate a protein, quite often we add a reagent such as ammonium sulfate, which competes with the water molecules. The water molecules are sequestered around the ammonium sulfate, and then the hydrophobic uh, parts of the protein can come together and it precipitates. So protein aggregate via hydrophobic interactions. Anion exchange chromatography is based on charge, so proteins can be positively charged and negatively charged, and this, can ch this is also a pH-dependent process, as we just talked about. And if you have an an uh, anion exchanger, that's a positively charged resin, the negatively charged proteins in blue will bind to it, and the, the red positively charged proteins will be repulsed and go through and wind up in the buffer wash coming through the column. After the proteins are bound, you wash off anything that won't bind, and then, then you elute the protein off with, chlor with chloride. You can actually use a gradient of increasing sodium chloride and separate out multiple uh, ne uh, positively char negatively charged proteins in the process. So it's a very useful method of separating proteins. Gel filtration separates proteins on size. Large ones go between the beads, and little ones spend time inside the beads. So the little ones come out last. So the big ones come out first, and then the little ones come out last in gel filtration. Now, purification-wise, this is not a very useful technique. Uh, because a lot of proteins have very similar sizes and the resolution of this is not uh, great unless you have extremely long columns. But you can uh, use column, long columns to, uh, you can calibrate them with proteins of known molecular weight and then estimate the molecular weight of your protein. For example, a dimeric protein would loop prior to its monomers. Affinity chromatography is based on the biological function or activity of an in protein or enzyme. Proteins lacking the function or affinity do not bind. Examples are antibodies and antigens. So here we have a column that has beads that has an antibody bound to it that recognizes uh, protein recognized by the antibody is red, protein not recognized by the antibody is blue. So all the blue stuff flows right on through and then the red things stick at pH 7 where the antibody is functioning. You can uh, change conditions so that the antibody antigen complex is uh, disrupted, usually pH 3, like 10th molars HCL works well, and then you can elute your protein over here. You can also put on inhibitors of enzymes onto these beads, and they will bind certain enzymes. For example, you can put a trypsin inhibitor on here and bind trypsin and then elute that at pH 3. Trypsin binds well at pH 7, at pH 3, its uh, binding is disrupted. So you can combine these techniques into ver multiple uh, ways. So here is a nine exchange uh, profile here with a concent uh, salt concentration gradient. And you can see the activity of your enzyme. The red line is all protein and the activity is in blue. And so you pull these fractions right here and get rid of all the other stuff. Then you run it on gel filtration, and there's some big proteins and some little proteins, and you concentrate on your peak here. And then finally, you do an affinity chromatography uh, technique in which there are lots of proteins that are not bound, and they wash through, and then you change the conditions and elute yours, and hopefully it's pure at this point. So here's a, uh, an example of a couple of methods for purification of the KEX2 protease that's found in the Golgi of the yeast. Method one, there was a membrane extraction uh, of, uh, of lysis of yeast. So you lysed the yeast and extracted out the membranes. You had a crude membrane extract, total protein, 736 milligrams. 
uh, specific activity, 0.38, that's the, the uh, activity, 280 units of activity divided by the total protein gets specific activity. And we call this 100% yield for the first step. And then enrichment is one here. Next time is DEAE cellulose. DEAE has a uh, positive charge on it, so this is anion uh, chromatography, anion exchange chromatography, and that enriches it about eightfold and increases the specific activity to three. Benzamidine is an affinity method, and arginine's an affinity, arginine sephirose is an affinity method, and finally we wind up with a specific activity of about 60, and wind up with 1.3 milligrams of uh, protein, and we've purified it 158 fold. S step method two, uh, involved the isolation of the Golgi by differential centrifugation. Once those were isolated, then they were extracted, much less protein here, but much higher specific activity to start with. And total activity was about the same. Yield was quite good here relative to this technique. And then DEAE uh, surface cell is a slightly different reagent just like DEA cellulose, only the beads are a little different. And then uh, that worked out quite well, high yield there. Uh, then UTI sephirose is human urine uh, trypsin inhibitor, and that's hooked on to sephirose, and this is a trypsin-like enzyme that likes lysine and arginine substrates. And then, so that one resulted in a real high purity. You got a specific activity of 260, almost four times what you had up here, and a real good yield of 72% versus 27% in this, this method. And so the enrichment factor was 684 here, much higher than here. So this method worked a lot better. Sometimes you have to try various methods to get there. This substrate has a paranitral anilid, so when this peptide bond between the arginine and the paranitral anilid is cleaved, you get this yellow product and you can measure that in a spectrophotometer, microprider, titer plate, and you're in good to go. So here's another purification table, and in this one you can see various methods, crude extract and total protein, total uh, phthalate degrading activity, this is units of activity, specific activity, purification fold, and recovery again, and they did ammonium sulfate fraction there. Here they just uh, added zero to ninety percent ammonium sulfate, precipitated out this activity. Good recovery of activity here, but um, not uh, didn't increase the specific activity a lot. Just about doubled it. Then they did a DEA cellulose, then a CM cellulose. This is a cation exchange uh, technique, and uh, so they wound up with uh, the the uh, little better purity. Then they use uh, Cephacryl S200 high resolution, that's gel filtration. Uh, that worked well. And then Mono S has a sulfate, it's very ne uh, very negatively charged, and so that worked well as, a, as well as a, uh, as a anion exchanger, cat cation exchanger, sorry. And then you uh, got a final pure protein. Now SDS page uh, SDS will denature proteins by binding to the protein, and about 1.3 grams of protein bind per gram of, uh, uh, sorry, 1.3 grams of SDS bind per gram of protein. And SDS is, as I said, is sodium dodecyl sulfate, and so it's a 12 carbon chain with a negative sulfate at one end. So that results in a uh, coated protein that has a uh, constant charge to mass ratio, depending, uh, doesn't matter what the size of the protein is. Now, slight difference. Some glycoproteins don't bind SDS quite the same as regular uh, as non-glycoproteins. -glyco but on electrophoresis, you separate by size rather than by charge because it has the uh, constant charge mass ratio, just like DNA or RNA. Uh, you can also use urea and guanidine hydrochloride to denature proteins by hydrogen bonding. Those are different techniques. SDS uh, page electrophoresis, uh, you have a polyacrylamide gel which acts as a sieve and, and under electrophoresis the protein is positively, uh, is uh, negatively charged so we have the negative uh, cathode up, uh, up here and we have the positive uh, anode down here and since we're uh, moving those anions down they migrate through here and then we can uh, the large ones move more slowly because they sieve more slowly through the gel and the, and the small ones migrate 
faster and then you can stain them to visualize your bands you can also run colored standards so you can measure uh, approximate sizes here relative to the ones others that are known uh, here's a purification in which we have a crude extract of some a couple of purification steps and final our product here at 40,000 molecular weight nice pure looks pretty pure uh, so it's a night as a way of measuring uh, protein purity as we go through a purification procedure you can also do 2D uh, gel electrophoresis, and this is done a lot in what we call proteomics. And in that process, we do isoelectric focusing in one direction where we have a gel that with a uh, pH gradient from 4 to 10 and then our protein migrates until it hits its isoelectric point and stops because it has net zero charge at its isoelectric point. Then this gel is turned and put on top of a SDS page uh, gel soaked in SDS and then SDS electrophoresis is run so now we sep in the second direction we separate on size. Charge in the first direction and size in the second direction and you can see how many protein spots you can separate out you can actually isolate these spots and then treat them with trypsin and then run them through a mass spec and determine what proteins these are kind of a neat process isn't it uh, that can be that can be used to uh, look at various diseases or uh, different uh, cell proteins in different conditions Proteolysis is also an important way. As I said, we cleave those up with trypsin. So you need to know what trypsin is. Trypsin cleaves at our lysines and arginines and uh, versus chymotrypsin at hydrophobics and elastase at, at aliphatic residues. This is the Schechter Burger nomenclature for, in, for proteolytic enzymes. And here is the polypeptide in black, uh, the bond that gets cleaved in pink here. And so this is the cleavage site. So that peptide bond is going to be hydrolyzed. This P1 residue is the most important residue, usually in, uh, in proteins. That uh, this would be for trypsin. This would be a lysine or arginine, and then the binding pocket has an aspartic acid with a negative charge that's complementary to the positive charges on the lysine or arginine. That's why it binds well in that binding pocket. But notice that there are other binding pockets as well. There's an S2 binding pocket for for residue P2. There's an S3 binding pocket for residue. Uh, SP3 and there's a uh, P1 prime, S1 prime, P2 prime, S2 prime pocket and P3 prime, uh, S3 prime pocket. So the protein, the enzyme which is in blue makes multiple contacts with its substrate in black uh, at various primarily at these different side chain residues and therefore has spec specificity is uh, delineated here. Now, so you have trypsin will cleave at lysine and arginine, but if it binds a lot better at P3 and P2, then it's going to cleave faster at, uh, if it likes these other subsite binding positions. Kind of an interesting concept, isn't it? So the enzyme doesn't make just one position. This is, this is the most important one, but it's not the only one. Edmund degradation sequencing. We can sequence proteins using the Edmund chemical reaction, and we use phenylisothiocyanate to do that, and it reacts with the amino terminus of a peptide. And under the right conditions, this process will cyclize to, to leave this final product, which is a phenylthiohydantoin amino acid. And this, these R groups are different, and so we can identify these via a HPLC. HPLC is high performance liquid chromatography, also known as high pressure liquid uh, chromatography. And so this process can be done and you get off the first amino acid and you identify it and then you do it again with the second on the second amino acid because you freed up a free amino group here in your peptide when you cleave this off and then you can so you can do it again so you move from the N terminus to the C terminal one amino acid per cycle. Now this is a chemical reaction it only goes to about 95 percent completion. So we sometimes you can't go very far. You can get maybe ten or twenty amino acids usually, uh, but it's a, it was power. It was a very powerful technique, and we used it a lot back in uh, many days ago. And I ran one of these brute machines for several years. That uh, was a great experience.
uh, mass spectral analysis to identify proteins. You can, if you can get them to ionize, and sometimes we put proteins on a matrix and hit it with a laser beam to get them to ionize, then they can fly in a vacuum tube, uh, which is called a flight tube, and they will fly based on their charge. So the ones that have a low, higher charge mass ratio will fly faster, and they can be detected. Uh, so the lightest ions arrived at the detector first, and the heavier ones arrived later, and so you can, so it's a, called a mass spec. Um, I, don't, I won't go into it any more than that. Uh, however, it's used in proteomics quite often. Uh, we have a cell or tissues, we take out the proteins, we run them on gels, we isolate out a band that we think is a very important uh, protein. We can digest that into peptides, we can run that down an, HPL, down an HPLC, liquid chromatography peptide separation. Then we can take, as they coming off the column, we electrospray ionize these things, the, the ionized peptides. The Ionized peptides are then analyzed in a mass, spec, mass spectrometer. If the peptide mass, masses resulting from tips, trypsin digestion can be determined by mass spectrometry using peptide mass fingerprinting, uh, this will uh, sometimes allow us to identify what the protein is from that because we can match this up with the genomic databases and uh, various other databases uh, that, that explicitly I'll give you links to that in your handout. But uh, if this does not allow unequivocal identification of the protein via database searching, Peptides can be sequenced via tandem mass spectrometry as some. Show these peptides then get fragmented again in a, in a, in a mass spec. Uh, and then those products, those uh, small ions, get sent on into another mass analyzer. And then we can get the sequences. So the sequence happens to be alanine, glycine, leucine in this peptide. So it's just an example. Now, extinction coefficients of pure proteins. Protein. To measure accurately the concentration of pure protein, we'd like to know the extinction coefficient. The extinction coefficient is based on the amount of tryptophan, tyrosine, and cysteine. And of course, we uh, this is a this uh, has been, this formula has been empirically determined, and we like to determine the absorbance of a 0.1% solution, that's one gram per mil or one milligram per mil, and that at 280 nanometers. So BSA has an extinction coefficient of 0.66, so a one milligram per mil solution will have 0.66. HSA is 0.53, and trypsin is 1.57, IgG, immunoglobulin G is 1.43, for example. Here's the reference for this, protein science back in 1995 and here is a link to the uh, proteomics website uh, the ecstasy website and uh, we're going to go there and I will uh, go down to the next slide and we're going to oops I can't do oops, sorry go back up I will have to escape out of this and I'm going to copy this amino acid sequence out of here. And then I'm going to go back to this and I'm going to pull this over. And here, and this is the proton, uh, pro param tool at the Expacy website. I'm going to paste that sequence right in here. I'm going to hit the compute parameters, and you're going to see that here's the sequence, numbered sequence, 260 amino acids total. Here's the molecular, here's the number of amino acids, 260. Molecular weight, 29,253.9. Theoretical isoelectric point is 4.58. Uh, this is the uh, composition, amount of arginine, amount, uh, and aspartic acid glutamic, amount of arginine and lysine. Uh, you can see that you have more aspartic and glutamic, therefore you have the low PI below 7. And then the extinction coefficients, uh, here's the molar extinction coefficient. So a one molar solution of this would absorb 280 nanometer light at, uh, would have a 46,090 absorbance. You never have a one molar solution of a protein. So we deal with uh, absorbance at 0.1%. That's, that's one milligram per mil or one gram per liter. And that's 1.57, very similar to trypsin, for example. Actually, this is DNAs. Uh, and so we have this 
this is useful information to, that you can use to understand your protein, what its structure and function is. And so now we're back. And here's an example of a table that has uh, a number of different proteins and their different extinction coefficients. And here's the, the A280 of a 1 milligram per mil solution or the 0.1% solution. Okay, so useful. Now, X-ray crystallography uh, is a, once you get a pure protein, you can sometimes crystallize it if you get the solubility just right, and I won't go into the details of that, but you can then hit that with an X-ray beam, and the, and the nucleus of the atoms will diffract those uh, X-rays. Those X-rays can be detected on film, or now we use a, uh, a, 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 an instant camera-like method of detecting these, and you get a diffraction pattern from that information on those diffraction patterns. Uh, we can uh, use uh, Fourier transform computers and very sophisticated software to create electron density maps. And those electron density maps can be converted into what looks like a th uh, 3D atomic model of the protein that's quite useful to study its structure and function. And here are some uh, websites. There are some vit nice videos for this as well to explain. This is the 100th anniversary of, of the discovery or development uh, by uh, Drs. Bragg and Bragg, father and son team, in uh, England. Uh, they developed X-ray crystallography of very small molecules years ago, and now it's been applied to proteins. And here is an example of a structure <coughs> spinning. Uh, this is a model I made, and this has this is human mast cell chymase, and it has carbohydrate chains stuck on the side. We just uh, this is a uh, this is the model of a recombinant protein that we made, and you can see the active site serine here 90, 195, the serine at the bottom of the binding site 189, the aspartic acid histidine that are also involved in the active site, and then these carbohydrates are stuck on one of them to asparagine 95. And the the other one to asparagine 72. So it's a very useful method to look at um, things. Now, Dr. Paul Stanton used to be president of East Tennessee State University. He was at, uh, started out life as a surgeon, then a dean, then president. And at graduation, he always gave this quote, do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can and all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as ever you can from John Wesley may grace and peace be yours in abundance 